friends, and welcome to another episode of the Long Distance Friends Podcast. My name is Liv. How are we doing today? How were your holidays? Did you survive? Was anyone mean? Did you start the fight? I hope I hope it was good. I had a lovely Thanksgiving. It was very pleasant. I spent it with family, which was really nice. Um, my brother-in-law was so kind and gracious with uh, his shout out on the show and his episodes that he's really enjoyed so far. So that was lovely. I, again, have notes. I don't have anything like crazy specific planned, but like I do want to talk about a couple of things. One, the history of pigeons. I have a special place in my heart for pigeons. And I brought this up at Thanksgiving and I've shared it with other people before, but pigeons were domesticated birds. Like pigeons were house pets and they were also, you know, carrier pigeons. They were very smart. They were trained by the government and they were an important part of society. Like they were cared for by people. They were loved. They were treated with respect and then one day they stopped being cool and we like I I want to emphasize so like pigeons were wild and then were domesticated now if you're in the U.S. you don't see pigeons in the wild you only see pigeons in like big cities because they are reliant on humans for survival because we bred the like instincts out of them and I feel like it it makes me really sad But more or less, like, it makes you look at society. And, like, one, it helps to, like, think of trends that, like, everything that is important right now is going to be tomorrow's pigeon. You know, in in some capacity, eventually, it's going to be the pigeons, you know, that it's let go of. And it's just something that few people care about later on. So think about that more, if you will. Another thing. So I'm I'm in my classical music era. I am in my classical music era. I don't care who knows it. Vivaldi's Four Seasons. I am digging right now, okay? Because it makes me feel like I am in like a big ball gown running through Versailles. Like that's the vibe that I get of like, I was not meant to be bathrobe, swinging chair in my back room. I'm meant to be like Victorian cupcake dresses, you know? I am meant to be laying in a field of lavender, laughing with the other ladies, and like just running around enjoying our dainty little days. When did we stop doing that? Seems like it'd be really fun. Not for the people that aren't involved, but for the people who are involved. I feel like that's an experience that, like, should be offered, you know? Like, here's all these different intricate ball gowns, and you can just pretend to be Marie Antoinette before she got beheaded. That'd be fun. So, Vivaldi's Four Seasons. uh, I was weightlifting to Vivaldi yesterday, and it was surprisingly really pleasant. Don't ask me why. I don't know why. But it was really enjoyable. I I feel like I feel like it awakens this like feminine rage within me where it like classical music makes you feel so much with so little. Like in theory, like modern music, you're giving me the words to like connect to and feel with. Whereas this, it is simply the orchestra waking feeling in you. And, like, not everybody feels the same way when they listen to it, you know? Like, some days I might listen to Winter and feel incredibly anxious, and other days I might listen to it and feel very passionate. But I I really am enjoying classical music right now. What does that say about me? I am an old soul who enjoys her Vivaldi. I also enjoy – who's the guy that wrote The Nutcracker? Chavosky? Uh, I don't know. It begins with a T. That guy. Good shit. We're in Christmas now. Happy Christmas. 
happy Hanukkah, happy Kwanzaa, happy Yule, happy winter solstice. We're not, we're not quite there, but we're getting there. Thanksgiving is over. The fall harvest holiday is gone. And now we get into the winter. It's amazing. I will be wearing this robe a lot more. I've got long sleeves on. I've got the robe on. I've got sweatpants on. I'm a very chilly girl. And here we are. The downfalls of this season is my skin gets very dry. No matter what I do to prevent it, my whole face is very dry. And I'm I'm doing all the things. I'm trying all the things. And it is still very dry. How often do you guys wash your hair? I wash my hair like once or twice a week. And I feel like that's enough. But sometimes I talk to people and they're like, I wash my hair three times a week or like I wash my hair once a month. And I'm like, well, it's the dry season. You know, it's winter. My hair does feel like it's thinning a little bit, which I know is crazy to say with thick hair. But like, I feel like it used to be thicker. Like, I know that it's a whole handful when I hold it, but a lot of my hair has been falling out recently probably because of the weather, because of hormones, because of whatever. And I don't know, maybe I should be taking vitamins for it. I don't know. But what I do know is that it's not as thick as it was four months ago. And I'd like it to to be nice and like, I don't want to have to worry about it thinning. So I'm only washing it like once or twice a week. And I do like a scalp treatment and the oils and all the things. But it's kind of a lot of work. Hi, bud. Do you want to say hello to the friends? You want to say hello? No? Okay. Good old Canooty Booty is in here. But yeah, um, I did have a little bit of a breakdown last week. Let's unpack it. So yes, um, I did get in my feelings. Thank you so much for listening if you did. I The holidays are tough. You know, the holidays are very tough. I do want to emphasize, I recorded that. And then like while I was editing – did get an invitation to spend the holiday with people. And I was like, I'm still releasing it because I think the biggest thing for me, hi Toulouse, is I I have two topics that I'm going to verbally journal out loud. The first topic is why do I feel so much responsibility and debt to everybody for my existence. You know, I feel so much responsibility to my siblings. I feel a lot of responsibility to the nuclear family unit that I was a part of. I feel so much responsibility to others and I don't always feel it to myself. And I am the most important person in my life because I am the only person who has been here from the first day until the last. So why, why am I putting every single person above me. You know, I grew up in a family that emphasized this mantra of like the family comes first and everything you do reflects this family and you have a responsibility to this family. I like, I think I understand what they were trying to get across of like my contributions are to like something bigger than me. And like, I need to be aware of that and I need to be mindful of it. But the way that it came across at the time was like, I'm PR for this organization and I need to make sure that it's being displayed in the best light possible. And it put weird pressure on me. And like, I think a lot about the way I understood things as a child, because like, that's just the way that it registered in my brain. And I don't think people thought twice about it of like, okay, if someone is insinuating that someone is not a good person, it's my responsibility to convince them otherwise. It is my responsibility to change the opinions of others. And in reality, as an adult, I understand that everyone is entitled to their opinion and it is not my responsibility to change their opinion. I I encourage discussion, but like I I tend to tell people like there's some things that like my opinion will change on its own, but like I don't want people to feel like it's their responsibility to change my mind because that doesn't create like a productive relationship. And so I was a very unproductive person for years because I had this core belief that my responsibility was to change minds about X, Y, Z. 
And, you know, then I, I did have a bigger family in my nuclear unit. And so it was like, okay, well, it's my responsibility to take care of the younger ones. It's as an older sibling, like my summers were spent, like, you know, for my sister and I, it was like, somebody has to stay home while parents are working because our brothers would like go to other people's houses, whatever. And it was like, well, someone has to stay home in case they need someone. So like my job was to stay at home in case they got hurt and in case they wanted to go home, like in case they needed me, I was there. And it was like, looking back at it, I realized how much of my childhood I kind of lost because of this, like, well, you're here just in case, you know, and I'm just sitting waiting for someone to need me. And like, I see now as an adult how it's hard for me to be like, hey, I want to go do these things. But I feel this pattern of like, well, I have to stay at home in case something happens. But I'm literally living by myself. Like, what am I waiting for? You know? And, you know, when I look at where does this come from? Why do I feel this responsibility? I was told to, you know? Like, I was told that I was a good sibling. I was a good child. I was a good person if I cared more about others than I did myself. And I didn't realize how detrimental that was until I became an adult who realized I don't care about myself at all. And because I don't care about myself, me caring for others means nothing. You know, it's not, no one is going to look at you and think you're a better person because you put everybody else's life mask on, like, uh, oxygen mask on before you put your own on. If anything, they're going to look at you and go, hey, like that's nice, but like really irresponsible. I didn't learn how to take care of myself. I didn't learn how to prioritize myself. I didn't learn how to value myself. I learned that my value came from other people's success and that my value came from taking care of others. When in reality, there were people whose job it was to take care of them. It wasn't my job. But it became my job. And I took so much pride in it. You know, I took so much pride that like I knew how to take care of those people and that I was the caretaker and that I was doing all these things. And I realize now, like, you know, sometimes I wonder, is it because I had the capability that maybe other people needed in order for it to be successful? But where did that leave me? You know, like looking back at it, I was just a kid. So yeah, I think that's the root of it. I also think I know that I am not a shallow person. I know that I can have seemingly shallow moments, but like to my core as a human being, like I am, I am the deep end of the pool. You know, if you've ever had a conversation with me, I've had to come to kind of realize this of like, I like to ask people questions that dig deeper in my mind that give me a deeper understanding of them and where they come from and how they think. And one of the best compliments I think I've ever received was having someone say that I I make them feel seen or I make them feel known from a deeper level. And I think that's what we all want. Like I've never met anyone who's like, oh yeah, my favorite thing in the world is to be in a situation where I don't feel like the people around me truly know me. To our core, we all want to feel seen from the bare bones of who we are, good, bad, bad, good, bad, ugly, you know, whatever. And still, and have someone look at us and go, I love all of these things. I love your worst moments. I love your best moments. And you can't do that unless you see me that deeply. And so why wouldn't I want to know more deeply who people are and see them at their core, you know? So I think that's where that comes from. The other thing that I I wanted to dive into is I had someone tell me they want me to journal on this and I've journaled it once, but I live a really active lifestyle. And when I say I live an active lifestyle, I mean, I am constantly moving and that's really normal in today's day and age, you know, everybody has so much going on. I work a corporate job for, you know, 45 hours a week, give or take. And then I come home and I spend 
probably three to five hours a week working out. And then this podcast is between two and six hours a week. Honestly, I take that back. It's probably between four and 12 hours a week because of everything that goes on behind the scenes. And then I spend probably 15 hours a week taking care of my cats. I sleep for, I'm trying to do math here, eight times seven. And that's being generous. 50 something hours a week. I don't know. But what do I do to feel calm? What do I do to feel stillness? And what do I do to have my brain feel calm? Because when I have free moments, I'm usually on TikTok, you know, like I don't want to have to have thoughts. I would love to just have others and go, oh, I like that. That's that feels good. That's triggering, you know, the dopamine release. But how do I unwind and find stillness? Because I don't like to, I mean, I'm in a swinging chair so that I can rock myself back and forth. Like I am not usually still, I never have been. And, you know, the first thought I had was like, well, Fridays, I usually do this yoga class and that consistently helps me. Like that's consistently the one time a week that I can acknowledge that like my brain is quiet, you know, like I go in there and I am, and I want to emphasize, like I've been doing yoga for years and the past four months, my brain has finally gotten to a place where it's like, just listen, just be present, be so fucking present. And I I laugh at the memes that are like, I have been so present. Like I'm so in the moment that like, I am not remembering things. And then you have to kind of remind me and I'm like, oh my God, yes, I did do that. I feel that. Like this yoga class is the one place where my brain is genuinely quiet and calm and still. And I'm noticing that like working out is starting to kind of do the same. That when I am just focusing on like the mindful movements of my body, when I'm focusing my mind on like moving and being intentional with, you know, movement and with how I am taking care of myself, I'm able to find some quiet. And like right now, my brain is quiet because I feel like I am just a constant stream of my thoughts. Like my thoughts are out loud, so they're quiet in my head. But how do we find more stillness in our life? How do we find ways to value being still over being busy? Because being busy is good, but like if I don't find stillness and calm, I'm going to burn out. I am not going to have, you know, this balance and this harmony that I am in an environment that talks so much about. You know, I need to have a work and life harmony where I'm getting fulfillment from both and I'm taking time to rest from both. And like, I'm doing more than just keeping myself afloat. I am taking good care of myself in every aspect. That's not easy to do if you don't know how, you know, I grew up with a lot of value being on being busy. You know, I grew up with, you're not just going to lay around the house, which is ironic with the whole, like, you're not going to lay around the house. But then, you know, summertime was like, once I hit a certain age, it was like, hey, uh, no, you can't go do things because someone needs to be here for your brothers. Like, okay, well, then what am I going to do? So I would just sit at home and be like riddled with anxiety. And like, I don't even remember what I would do. Like it, I, it's like blacked out chores and then just, I don't know, be miserable in teenage angst. I worked a lot. Like I've been working since I was 14 years old. I started working because I quit ballet and my parents said, well, if you're going to quit dance, then you're like, you're not just going to sit at home. You're going to get a job. Either you can dance or you can get a job. And my dad would drive me up to the local uh, grocery store every single weekend to have me ask them if they'd looked at my application yet. And like legally, I was more of a liability to them than I brought to their operation. But I was, I, it was never valued to me of like being still or enjoying calm. And 
I'm having to learn as I get older, how to listen to my body because like I get tired a lot easier. Like I am chronically more tired and I have been for years, but I've always treated it with like, we'll just drink a cup of coffee and just keep going. But like my body is so tired because I never let it rest. I never honored my body's needs when it came to like finding stillness and being present and listening when I hurt, you know, I, I think about like, I also find this is, thank you. This is triggering it for me. I also find stillness when I am like having my body taken care of. Um, so like I used to get my nails done regularly. I used to get facials regularly. I was getting massages pretty, like pretty regularly. Mind you, I was single and like physical touch is important for me. And those were ways that I could fulfill those needs. But like having somebody else work on me lets me get really introspective because I'm like somebody else is taking care of this and now I can focus on like deeper. And I haven't been able to do that in a while. I was getting a massage uh, this week and like basically had someone who was like, hey, like these muscles here and here are like not well off. And like, like my, uh, the muscles under my collarbones are all kinds of jank. And I don't know, like, you don't know that until somebody who knows better talks to you about it. And like, I think of growing up, I had a lot of, um, pain. I had chronic pain in my joints and my back. And then it's, you know, funny to grow up and have someone look at me and be like, yeah, you have like moderate scoliosis. Was this not something that was brought up a lot as a kid? And I'm like, no, every time that I said my back hurt, it was like, you're too young. Or, you know, I was being dramatic or I needed to just go for a run or it's because I wasn't in good enough shape. And in reality, like, no, my body was not correct. And so having to look back at years of unvalidated pain and try to validate myself and now as an adult, look at it and go, how do I know what pain is normal and what isn't normal? Because I have been living with overly tense muscles and ligaments and my body has been coping, but not correct for 15 years like that's wild to me. And, you know, now I have to learn how to correct it. Like, first of all, that's fucking bullshit. And two, the fuck do I do? You know, like, I don't know, but I'm able to find stillness when I, when I'm able to let go. Oh, fuck. I'm going to get all deep, aren't I? I'm able to find calm when I feel safe to let go. And when do I feel safe to let go? I feel safe to let go When I have the confidence that I am letting go and letting someone else who is capable and knowledgeable take the lead. But if I don't feel like that person can take the lead and that they don't have, I don't know, maybe it's a level of competency of like, you can take charge. Like if I'm getting a massage, I'm not going to be sitting there telling the masseuse, hey, you're doing this wrong because they are the professional. They know how to do their job. I am not going to tell my chiropractor, actually, that's not the right spot because this is someone who has 30 years of experience and knows what they're doing and had the training. I didn't. Now I can provide feedback of like, hey, that didn't feel great and they can adjust, but my focus needs to be on how do I feel? Is this good feel or bad feel? And let go. You know, I think of like relationships that like I was not able to let go because I was like this person does not have the competence to provide me the security that I need to say, I don't have to worry. Like, okay, that's noticeable. That's very noticeable. It's kind of a slap in the face. But like, I mean, even as a kid, like there were things with my family where I was like, I took over and I was like, it gives me anxiety when they try to do certain things because I'm like, you guys aren't capable of these things. You're not competent enough for it because based off of what I have seen you do, whether it was joking or not, I don't trust that you doing these things is going to allow me to take a step back and be calm. I feel like I have to be on edge because you're going to hurt yourself. You're going to do it wrong or whatever. And then I'm going to have to step in. So 
how do I surround myself with people who I have the confidence in their competencies to do things in order to allow me to sit back and relax? Because I want to sit back and relax. I do. But like, hey, prove to me that I can, you know, show me that you have the ability because otherwise you're going to show me that you don't have the ability and I'm either going to continue to feel anxious around people or I'm going to like never want to see them again. Love my family, but like there's a lot of things that like I just don't enjoy being around them for because I'm like, you don't do these things well and I don't trust, I don't have confidence in your capabilities. Not to be the bad guy, but like just say it. Does that make, guys, does that make me sound like the bad guy? Does that make me, does that make me not look like, like the fun, silly, goofy girl? What else did I want to talk about? I know I've only been recording for like 20 minutes, but I'm tired. Oh, you know what? I want your feedback. I want to go on a weekend trip and I don't know where a good weekend little trip spot would be. I've looked up a bunch of small towns. I don't know what my budget is. Think like a lesser budget, but like I want to do something fun. I want to get out of town and I don't know where to go. So if you have any recommendations, DM me because like I want to I want to do something fun. Okay. The winter wonderland is coming. I will deal with this tomorrow. Sorry. Um, sorry, I got to go through my notes, guys. Oh, I finished another book. Um, I finished Iron Flame. It's the second book in the fourth wing series. Really good. Honestly, it's super fun. I, I'm big into audiobooks. So I listened to my audiobooks at 1.75 speed. And it really bothers people around me. And I'm like, this sounds like the normal speaking pace for me, though. Like, this sounds like a regular, like, conversational pace. Whereas listening to it at one one time speed sounds like they are talking like this. And it really bothers me. Because it sounds robotic. Like, I just, it bothers the shit out of me. Like, you're talking this slow for why? So, yeah, there's that. Um, The book was really good. I waited until I got enough spoilers to read it. Because guess what? I don't, I don't want to, like, go into things blind, you know? I, if it's, like, a book or something, especially when people are like, hey, this emotionally, like, it did not fully emotionally scar me the way a lot of people are saying it did for them maybe because I read the spoilers but like I need them okay I need to have the discussions about what's going on before I enter into it because I want to be fully prepared I want to be fully prepared I was I very much enjoyed the story like I do enjoy the stories I am also re-listening to A Court of Thorns and Roses because yeah, it's been a while. I may as well listen back in. I'm also starting a new series that's just kind of like, I don't have a lot of emotional investment in, but it's fun and it's it's all right. Um, If you have any good book recommendations, let me know. I don't want to read anything that's real. I want it all to be uh, science fiction, fantasy, romance, just fill my life with, you know, all of the fake stories that bring me joy. Okay. If it really happened, I don't care. I will watch reality TV, but I don't want to read reality books, all right? I want to read about the fairies, and I want to read about the dragons, and I want to read about... So let's break this down. 2009. Let's let's take it back 15 years. In 2009, everybody and their mother was loving werewolves and vampires. And like everything was werewolf vampire, right? It was like werewolves and vampires hate each other, and they're... Werewolves, vampires, and zombies. Oh my God, everything was like the undead. Now everything is the fae, the fairies. And I love it, okay? I'm a big fan. I love the world building of these like fae existence, like these fae worlds of like, I think that's why I enjoy these so much is because like, the werewolves and vampires, it was just like, here is fictional things that are in the real world versus 
here are completely new worlds that you get to like explore and there's a joy in it and there's like the good parts of it you know of like the the flowers and the social dynamics of this make-believe world and like why they are the way that they are and like the the storylines themselves have very real things in them but it's presented under the guise of like all of this is fake you will never find this place and so it gets to be as beautiful as your mind can create it to be and I love that you know I miss having things that entice my imagination and I feel like these worlds do that they entice my imagination they encourage me to create you know what does the most beautiful place in the world look like to me you know like how does this fit into my ability to imagine and then getting to see like the fan art of these things Sorry, as I'm talking about this, uh, one of my girlfriends, Delaney, who was on the podcast, uh, just got bookmarks that are A Court of Thorns and Roses and Fourth Wing. Um, And they're fucking hilarious. Uh, The Fourth Wing one says Zaddy's Girl, spelled X-A-D-D-Y. The A Court of Thorns and Roses ones says I Can't Even Read. The... The Court of Mist and Fury one says, fuck you, Tamlin. The A Court of Mist and Ruined one says, the scary bathtub. The, what is it? The, like, Winter Solstice-y one, the, like, 3.5 book says, Big Grinch Energy. And then the A Court of Silver Flame one says, step porn, which makes me giggle. Um, They're not related. But, yeah, so I... I enjoy the make-believes and I think that we all should like why are we living this life without magic and I say that not like the magic that you read about in these books but like there is magic in every day and I I choose to believe in the magic that exists around me you know I believe that you know, finding a ladybug on me is good luck. This week I had a bunny that has graced my backyard several times. I pulled up in the driveway and it was sitting in my yard and it didn't run away. And I was like, oh, hi, like, what you doing? And I just sat there and like hung out with it. And there was something, one very like youthful about it, very like pleasant of being young and and excited, but like sitting there petting this random potentially wild bunny and being like this creature trusts me you know this creature is coming to me and is gonna sit here while I say hey stay here let me go grab some carrots out of my refrigerator and did you know I can either choose to look at that and be like oh someone probably threw away their bunny and it it's starving or I can say hey there's there's a moment of magic in this this interaction and Maybe this animal sees something in me that I'm not seeing in myself. You know, let me look a little deeper and and see that there's joy in this moment of like, wow, this creature that doesn't know me can feel my energy and knows that I'm safe. What a compliment that an animal that has an instinct to to be afraid of me is going to come over here and and eat out of the palm of my hand and let me pet it and hang out with me for a little bit. And then it's going to hop away and it's going to go back to its life. But hey, I got to have this nice moment with this creature that in my head maybe lives a hard life. But for it, that's just its life. And it is giving me a moment to smile about and feel joy in. Because who doesn't feel joy that, you know, a stray animal trusts you? I think that's a huge compliment in life is when, you know, nature's creatures come to us. When ladybugs land on me or butterflies fly by me, I feel joy in that. I feel the magic in those moments because, you know, that's good luck. That's a loved one saying hello. That's, you know, being recognized as being a good human in my book. And not for everybody, but like, that's how I see it. So 
my goal for everyone today is to find the magic in your mundane. Find the intentionality in the mindless movements of your life. Because without them, what are we? And what are we doing? Um, I might try to get a haircut. I know I've been saying that for months. But like this is, this is a lot. And I feel like maybe I wouldn't feel like my hair is falling out so much if it was like a little, just a couple inches. But yeah, um, find the magic in your moments. Because being able to find magic in the mundane moments of our life is what makes life worth living. And it's part of your pie crust. And I don't know, I'm going to go do something today that brings me magic. I'm tired of being kind of anxious and I'm tired of being worried about things that are outside of my control. So I'm going to focus on what is within my control. And what's within my control is what I do and how I prioritize myself and my well-being and my pleasure. So I'm going to go do something today that brings me pleasure. And I hope you do too. Have a nice day. Um, follow us on Instagram at Long D Friends Pod. Email us at Long D Friends Podcast. Long D Friends Pod. Long D Friends Pod at gmail.com. And DM me, comment, like, subscribe, give us five stars. I work very hard. Please, thank you. Um, love you all. Have a great week. Bye.